This is Radio Equal Shock with your host, Alex Smith. Levels of the strong warming gas methane are again rising in the atmosphere. A new study warns the trend could derail plans made at Paris to contain climate change if things continue. Is the new surge of methane coming from the Arctic? Is it from fracking and natural gas pipelines? Guess again. Our next guest investigated the new mystery methane surge. Professor Ewan Nisbet is a professor of earth sciences at the Royal Holloway, University of London. On February 5, 2019, the AGU published the paper Very Strong Atmospheric Methane Growth in the Four Years 2014-2017, Implications for the Paris Agreement. The lead author is Ewan Nisbet. Dr. Nisbet, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Hi, nice to talk to you. You too. Now, for the public, global warming is about carbon dioxide. And for years, experts said methane doesn't really matter because it's a short-lived gas. What do you say? Well, uh, lots of things are important, um, as apples and oranges. Uh, Methane is actually very important indeed. You can rate it various different ways because it depends on the time scale, but it's it's nearly half as important, uh, well, depending on how you count it, maybe in some countings more than half as important as CO2. Uh, the other thing is, in some ways, you can actually get at methane much more easily uh, rather than changing the entire world economy, which we have to do for CO2, which we have to do. We need to do everything on CO2, but we, we mustn't forget the Cinderella gas, which is methane. And there's another one also, um, N2O, plus some others. So the other gases are also very, very, very important. And for background, what was the level of methane in the atmosphere before the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s? Well, first of all, don't really talk about levels, not a bucket of water. The amount, or it's called the methane burden, or in chemistry we talk about the mole fraction. It's now around about, uh, if you have a billion litres of air, you'll have around about 1,900 of those will be methane. Before the Industrial Revolution, 1,000 or below, and way, way back in the Ice Ages, it would be three, four hundreds. So we've pushed it up a very long way, uh, proportionately much further than CO2. And when I started this radio program in 2006, scientists told us methane, the burden in the atmosphere, was either paused or growing very slowly. When did the new growth start? Okay, well, I'll, I'll wind you back a bit. For the last 200 years, it's been going up. And we know, because of the types of carbon in it, that it's been fossil fuels driving it up. And especially in the 1980s, when it was going up like crazy, particularly when the Russians were um, putting in their very large gas industry. And it, it looked as if it was equilibrating around about 2000. And from 2000 to 2006, it was going up and down. But basically fairly stable. We thought that the sources equaled the sinks, and so although methane was very, very high, it's like you're driving down the highway at 180 miles an hour, but you're not actually accelerating anymore. And then in 2007, something very strange happened, and methane started growing again pretty strongly. And then in 2014, it just went back to the growth rates of back in the 1980s. But the difference is the types of carbon-12, carbon-13 ratio in it was indicating that it it wasn't necessarily fossil fuels that were doing this. It was something else. It was uh, biological processes. Well, let's get to a key question. How can scientists measure methane in the atmosphere and then know the source of it? It's tough. Um, The answer is no, we don't. What we do, um, particularly the American NOAA network, we have a network of stations around the world where people, uh, there are a few instruments that record all the time, but people collect flasks of air. And so we're tracking CO2 and methane and the other gases from these flasks, particularly the American network. We also have a UK network that we run, and there are other ones in New Zealand, as well, and Canada's got a very good network across Canada, Environment Canada. So that, that's telling you where it's growing, and so you'll see that it's growing faster, say, in the tropics than the Arctic, things like that. But then also we analyze the methane. It's, methane is CH4, and carbon comes in carbon-12 and carbon-13, and there's also radioactive carbon-14. And if you analyze um, those different types, the methane from geological sources and also from fires so from coal and gas and, and from fires, that tends to be richer in carbon-13 
relatively rich. Uh, whereas methane that comes from a swamp or a wetland or a landfill or a sewage plant or a cow, that tends to be somewhat richer in carbon-12. So if you analyze what's happening to the carbon-12-13 ratio, you can then figure out who's actually driving the increase and also, of course, what the proportions are of the various gas, various sources. And your team recently returned from Africa with new samples. Tell us about that expedition. Well, there's back history here. Very long ago in the 1980s, I, I worked in Saskatoon for a long time. Uh, my family's half from the prairies. And I was the one who actually suggested that methane in the Arctic was rising um, because of methane hydrates. It's long ago. And we've been watching the Arctic and doing a lot of work in the Arctic. But the bulk of the rise, apart from 2007, in the last 10 years, has been led from the tropics. Something was happening in the tropics we didn't understand. We have a, a wonderful aircraft that we have been flying around in the Arctic. It's the UK Atmospheric Research Aircraft. And so we've been flying that over African wetlands in collaboration with the Ugandan Meteorological Authority and also the Zambian Ministry of Mines and Geological Survey in Zambia, uh, looking at these very big wetlands in Central Africa because we think that a lot of the growth is happening in the tropics, in the wet tropics. And that may be coming from wetlands or it may be coming from cows or some other process. Uh, a cow is essentially a walking wetland. In terms of biology, it's pretty much the same. And we're trying to figure out just how much is coming off there. We're also working, ironically, in, in conjunction with the British Antarctic Survey, who have aircraft that when they fly north up to service them in Calgary, the Twin Otters, they're going to be stopping in Bolivia and working with the physics department in La Paz to try to look at Bolivian emissions and uh, emissions in the, the wetlands of South America. So we're trying to figure out what's actually happening in the tropics with the methane budget. And there's very little work on it so far. Well, as you say, we've heard so much about methane from the Arctic and from natural gas systems. Most of us have never seen a tropical peat bog, and we have no idea how they operate. Can you describe the landscape that is releasing more methane? Yeah. Well, it's pretty complex. I've, I've done huge amounts of work in the Arctic, and Arctic bogs are active for about sort of six, eight weeks in the summer when they get hot. In the tropics... Uh, the intertropical convergence zone, which is also the monsoon in, in Asia, it sweeps north and south. Right now it's down in Zambia, and then it sweeps back up to north of Nigeria, and it will be up there in July, August, later on in, in the year. And crosses, of course, uh, place the equatorial parts twice, uh, like Uganda. So Uganda's pretty wet, and Zambia's got these enormous wetlands. And also around there are lots of cows, and there's lots of biomass burning as well, people burning fires and crop and so on. And all of these processes are making methane. Anytime you get a swamp, you get rotting vegetation, it becomes anaerobic. And then you get microbes, they're, they're called archaea, um, methanogenic um, archaea. They make methane, the sort of bottom end of the breakdown stage. And you also get pretty much the same thing going on inside a cow's tummy. And uh, out of that comes this gas methane. Um, a lot of it, uh, as it comes up through the water or wherever it is, gets reoxidized by bacteria called methanotrophs. So that just gets turned into CO2. But a lot of it gets into the air. And, for example, in our flights recently, they were flying over uh, Lake Banguiulu, which is a big lake in Zambia. It's actually where David Livingston died. And um, means where the water sky meets the sky. It's wonderful, wonderful photos. And they found a huge plume of methane coming off that. They're Bangweelu wetlands. They're just pouring out methane. Do we have any idea what would stimulate more methane coming from the tropics starting around 2007? Well, climate change, uh, this looks like the warming feeding the warming. I've got to be careful because there are other explanations too. But the tropics are getting more active. Uh, they're getting wetter, warmer, and expanding. The, sorry, the rainfall tropics, the meteorological tropics. You know, the line around the Earth stays pretty much the same. Um, but the belt of, of rainfall that moves north and south is getting warmer and wetter and stronger. And if you add an awful lot of water on a bit of flat ground, you're going to get a big lot of wetland and lots of, in Africa, it's papyrus, uh, papyrus swamps. And that's something called a C4 plant. It grows like crazy. 
if you've ever seen paper, paper comes from papyrus uh, originally. And these are very, very productive wetlands. And around them, of course, more rain, you get more grass, you get more cows. Population growth is extremely high in these areas. The population, so it's one of the area where the population growth is fastest around the world. So lots of human population going up as well. And they, they've got more cows and more of this, that, and the other. And they're also throwing fertilizer on the ground now. So everything is going up, and uh, the result is an awful lot more rotting vegetation um, in the wetlands, and the wetlands getting wetter, and uh, lots more cows, um, everything, and also lots more fires burning the crop waste, and goodness knows what. Um, all these things are making me think. And more sewage from people, too. Ewan, how do you know the growing levels of methane are not simply due to a change in atmospheric chemistry, which gives methane perhaps a longer lifetime or something that would bring higher levels without any increase on the ground? No, well, that's part of our big discussion we're having at the moment, and, and uh, in particular this group in Harvard and Caltech who've been suggesting this, because along with climate change and all the various things we're throwing in the atmosphere, we run the risk of changing the cleaning power of the atmosphere. If you imagine water, uh, H2O, well, HOH, if you knock off an H with um, reactions to do with light and, and oxygen, you'll get OH, and that's called the policeman of the atmosphere. The OH is what oxidizes all the bad species, um, all the pollutants. Plus, uh, methane isn't strictly a pollutant. It's a natural greenhouse gas, but it oxidizes methane to carbon dioxide, which has far, actually far less warming impact per unit than methane does. So if you do something to change the OH, you're basically shooting the policeman. And that means that the methane will increase, the methane burden will increase. And it's possible that the OH in the atmosphere, particularly in certain areas where pollution of other gases is, is bad, that may have been declining. And therefore the methane would go up because there's less policemen to catch the bad guys. As you know, there's almost a competition for other ideas for the sources of the new methane growth. What about the increasing super wildfires in recent years as the planet heats up? Now, this is where the carbon isotopes come in. Yeah, wildfires could be happening. Actually, in the last few years, there's some evidence suggesting actually the amount of wildfires in the tropics is declining um, rather than increasing. But that varies quite a lot. Now, the methane that comes from fires tends to be relatively rich in carbon-13. And there's a discussion, um, a suggestion from John Worden in the NASA JPL. He suggested that actually methane from natural gas leaks is increasing. But because the fires have been decreasing, uh, it's sort of hiding the isotopic effect on the carbon-12-13 ratio. And so... Maybe fires have been decreasing, but uh, emissions from gas leaks and so on have been increasing, and that could be part of the cause as well. Now, all of these things that are driving the methane budget, they're not exclusive. They could all be happening, um, and the question is working out the proportion. And for that, we use what are called inverse models. You take all the measurements you've got around the world, and then you take all the isotopes as well, and then you do a giant mathematical model, but you've got to add in the, the winds and the fact that the methane gets blown from A to B. And so it's pretty complicated computing. And you can try to figure out where the source areas are, what's putting what in, but it's a tough one. You can help Radio EcoShock keep going. Make a donation at our website, ecoshock.org. You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. As always, I'm your host, Alex Smith. Our guest is Dr. Ewan Nisbet, Professor of Earth Sciences at Royal Holloway in London. We're talking about a new surge of methane as dangerous warming gas into the atmosphere. Scientists tell us carbon dioxide tends to become evenly distributed in the global atmosphere. Is that true of methane? And if not, can localized methane drive localized warming? <laughs> Uh, methane mixes across the planet in about a year. If you actually look at where methane is, there's sort of waterfall on the hemispheric boundary, which is the intertropical convergence. It's significantly higher in the northern hemisphere. The methane death zone is where OH is strongest, and that's in the moist air uh, where the sun is very bright, and that's in the, the tropical belt where the sun's vertical in daytime. 
So methane blows southwards. The southern hemisphere sources as well, but the, the overwhelming sources are in the northern hemisphere. CO2 mixes as well. In terms of local regions, yes, the methane mixes. The bigger impacts locally are, of course, air pollution. For example, China and India live under a very, very heavy haze, if you've ever been to Beijing in November. And increasingly now, heavily populated parts of Africa also, particularly in the dry season, um, very, very strong burning. So that's actually probably got a big impact on local temperatures. And then we've a huge amount of deforestation going on. Not entirely. Some areas are actually growing forest. Um, and that changes local temperature as well. So all these factors are going on. So each local area has got its own particular factors happening to warm it, or if it's heavily under a burden of horrendous pollution, it might cool it, depending on what's happening locally. You were very interested in methane coming out of the Arctic, and we do have a lot of warnings that perhaps clathrates, that the frozen methane under shallow seabeds might thaw and emit more methane. Should we take our eyes off the Arctic now that we know that the tropics are the source of the new increase? No. <laughs> the, if you're in a boxing match and somebody's hitting you upwards, you, you, know, you don't take your eyes off the other hand. No, I, I was actually the person who suggested that a long time ago in, in the 80s when I worked in Saskatoon. And we have found a while ago evidence, um, strong evidence, for example, of Spitsbergen of uh, plumes of methane coming up in uh, several hundred meters of water. Now, the, the nice thing is that that methane is released into the water or in the permafrost. It's coming up through the permafrost, but it gets picked up by methanotrophic bacteria. It's food for them. They take the methane and essentially convert it to CO2 and make a living out of that. So essentially, they're doing what you do when you burn gas. And between them and dissolution in the water... They're pretty efficient, so it gets up through 100 meters of water or so, but we get a five flasks a week from Spitsbergen, and these are air flasks, because we're, we're watching for exactly that. And as far as we can tell, the Arctic is not releasing significant amounts of methane from hydrates at the moment. There, there, there may be burps from particular sources occasionally, but uh, if you look in the Arctic in the summer, the methane comes from the Arctic wetlands. The isotopes are pretty clear on that. In the winter, the main sources seem to be um, the gas fields. Russia's, some of the world's biggest gas fields are in the Russian, in the Siberian Arctic. And you can measure, say, in Spitsbergen and then track the air back to where it last touched ground, and that will be in, over the gas fields. So we think at the moment the Arctic is not leading the world in methane growth. In 2007, there was a period where um, there was strong growth. That appeared probably to be in air that was blown from very warm boreal regions, northern Canada, northern Siberia, up into the, the high Arctic. So right now, the Arctic is not at the top of our worry list, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't look at it. It's very important we look at it. Canada's got a um, very important station at alert, which is measuring the air. And Norway measures in Spitsbergen, Americans in Barrow, and there's um, a station run with the Russians and the Finns at a place called Tixi. So there is a bit of watching in the Arctic. We get flasks from alerts and from Spitsbergen, and so we're watching it pretty carefully. But right now, the concern is actually in the tropics. Well, I'm glad to hear there's eyes on up there. So let's say the current trend of biogenic emissions continues. Why do you say that could affect the Paris Climate Agreement? We think it's probably biogenic, but it could also be all these other factors as well. Uh, whatever it is, methane is going up fast. Now, essentially, the Paris Agreement allows you a certain amount of warming. Um, uh, the agreement was either 1.5 or 2 degrees. And that, that translates into so much emission. It's not very much of CO2 and CH4 before we hit our limit. How do you get there? One way of getting there is to, which was really thought of in the scenarios that led to the Paris Agreement, was that we can probably get methane under some degree of control because a significant proportion of the methane comes from the natural gas and coal industries, and that's relatively easy to reduce. 
So um, if we do that, that gives us a little bit more time to basically change the world's economy and get CO2 emissions under control. However, if methane is rocketing up, that, that leaves you far less sort of carbon dioxide space uh, if you're going to hit the Paris target. And it's going up so much that the sort of emission space that we've got before 2100 is getting quite significantly less than was thought of when everyone signed the Paris Agreement. So it threatens the Paris Agreement quite badly. Well, obviously, we could cut emissions that are leaking out of our pipelines and fracking pads and all that sort of thing and, and, and change over to renewables. But is there anything we humans can do to reduce the new surge of methane coming from the tropics and the southern hemisphere? Complex. The first thing to do is exactly what you said, cut the natural gas emissions and the coal emissions. And actually, the frackers, um, the recent work on the frackers, um, have been pretty good. Some of the early work by NOAA, uh, by people like, Anna Carrion and Gabby Petron showed that the frackers were losing, say, 9% of their gas just to air. Nowadays, the more recent work has shown that they've cut those leaks very significantly, and um, in some fracking areas, the, the leaks have come down enormously, uh, probably because that's profit. If you leak gas, that's profit. But there's still huge losses from the gas industry and from the coal industry, the good side is that our ability to detect where emissions are coming from is very much better than it used to be. For big leaks, um, you can put sensors on drones and so on. For small leaks, all, uh, all you do is you drive around um, with an instrument and you can, you can locate the leak pretty well. Once you know where the leak is, stopping it is a no-brainer. That's also true of uh, gas distribution leaks in urban areas. We drive around London and we pick up all the leaks. If only we can just persuade the industry to stop those leaks, it would take a huge amount out. Coal mine's another one. We really need to do something about it. Now, in the tropics, different problem. First of all, the cow part of it, which is pretty significant, there's discussion about how much of it, but it's quite a lot. The cow superpowers are countries like India, uh, Ethiopia, Brazil, um, South Sudan, where a cow is a very major part of the culture. And trying to reduce that is quite complex. Trying to persuade Westerners to eat a bit less meat, that's okay. But you've got to be careful because if you, for example, replace an organic cow on a pasture in Scotland with something intensively grown agriculture somewhere in the tropics, which you've now imported or some whatever, um, you're not necessarily winning on greenhouse terms. So it's, it's a pretty complex argument. But we could certainly reduce the agricultural emissions and do a lot more to do that. It's not as easy as reducing the gas industry, but it helps. With the wetlands, not much, um, except try to be careful about letting fertilizers run into them, but I suspect that's not possible. What we could do, though, is reduce some of the biomass burning in the tropics, um, particularly as that's also a major cause of air pollution. And it exports agricultural soil nutrients to the air and eventually to the oceans. Africa's fires are feeding the fish in the Atlantic and actually feeding um, Amazonia eventually. I did not know that. Another exciting new fact from science. Burn your plant and it goes up in the air and all the nutrients go with it. <laughs> got to land somewhere. And in Africa in particular, they burn like crazy. I'm, I'm Zimbabwean, as you probably got from my accent. So, sorry, Zimbabwean Canadian, it's a mess. So I, I grew up with these fires, and uh, in Harare in July, August, you choke. Well, it depends on the year, but some years. We're choking here now in July and August, but it's due to wildfires. We've had uh, wildfire emergencies every year for the last three years. I spent a lot of time as a geologist mapping in northern Canada, so I, I know those fires scary sometimes too. So this steep curve of atmospheric methane isn't happening in isolation from other steep curves for both carbon dioxide and global temperatures. In that scenario, is it possible we could experience a burst of extra heating in part due to a methane spike? Well, I wouldn't call it a spike. Um, we don't know where it's going. We know the upside. We don't know if there's a downside on it. <laughs> it's a, you know, a spike implies a downside. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty worrying. If it carries on growing at the current rate, we're in pretty serious trouble. Now, I, I shouldn't be entirely doom and gloom. We do have one very, very good story 
which is the banning of the chlorofluorocarbons through the Montreal Protocol. And that primarily was done by Margaret Thatcher, who sat down and read the science and then persuaded George Bush I that this was really, really important. But she was an excellent chemist, and so she read the scientific papers, I'm told. And the CFCs, apart from saving the ozone, and if they hadn't done that, by, by now the ozone problems worldwide would be very, very serious indeed, uh, affecting an awful lot of life, including plant life and early crops. But uh, as well as doing that, the CFCs are very powerful greenhouse gases. And one of the most effective actions we've ever taken on, green, on the greenhouse was to ban the CFCs. That was a huge and effective action. We can do the same sort of thing with methane really trying to reduce gas leaks, coal mine emissions. I remember, too, James Hansen and George Bush II came out with the methane control program, which included trying to harvest it from uh, dumps and landfills, and they had a whole program to do that. No, no, actually, to be fair, um, in Europe and North America, um, landfills now, we do a lot of work around landfills, are emitting far, far less than they used to. But what has surprised me is the extent recently of landfills in the tropics. When I was a child in in Africa, all of our rubbish went in a hole in the ground and we threw some ash on it. But basically it got oxidized. It it didn't produce. It was just in the backyard, really. Nowadays, um, all over the tropics, there's some very big cities with very big open landfills. And very often these landfills are on fire as well. And they're an obvious thing to do something about. Simplest thing you need to do is just put some soil on it and then the methanotrophic bacteria will have a habitat and they'll eat the methane coming off. You know, that's very simple technology. Most landfills in Europe are very heavily piped and instrumented and then you take off the methane and you make electricity with that at stage two. And that's quite doable with tropical landfills also um, and we need to be doing that. So I, I would put landfills as pretty high on my list, tropical landfills, for mitigation efforts, because right now they're just heaps. You and Nisbet, we're pretty close to our time here, but what are your next steps for your research here? Um, pretty complicated. Um, I'd like to do a, a lot more work on the isotopes in the tropics to figure out what the signatures of the emissions are. I also have a long-term pet project, which has spent years trying to get going, to put a, a decent observatory on Ascension Island in the central Atlantic. We have Mauna Loa, which is essential in the Pacific. But in the Atlantic, in the remote Atlantic, we have flasks from Ascension Island, but we don't actually have sort of continuous, steady measurement of lots and lots of gases. And it's an ideal site, and we really ought to try to do something there. But that's taken years, and it's it sort of staggers along. From the UK, we've been speaking with Dr. Ewan Nisbet, Professor of Earth Sciences at the Royal Hallway, University of London. You can find links to his team's paper in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Ewan, thank you so much for talking with us. It's been fun talking to you. Thanks a lot. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. Check out the Radio Ecoshock website. We're at ecoshock.org. <laughs>